uh, there is a uh, lot more to learn about uh, this uh, uh, gentle jain uh, so i humbly request uh, uh, dr uh, ps isha who is a former director of uh, uh, kerala forest research institute in pichi he is a veteran in this field of wildlife and conservation over the last uh, 35 years and he has a lot of research and experience in the field uh, he has a, a specific contribution to the conservation of elephant and man life uh, animal conflict man animal conflict and he is very active environmental uh, educationalist as well as policy maker and he is a member of various decision making bodies member of state wildlife Bo uh, board government of india government of chatisgarh as well as the ministry of environment and forest government of india he also served as the project uh, elephant steering committee and he is also widely published in the field of wildlife and conservation and he has edited an illustrated series on biodiversity in kerala featuring various uh, taxa of uh, biological spectrum in the regi region and he has to his credit 42 research uh, reports and 42 research papers and 10 books and he is also a very highly uh, academician still guiding many of the students for their phd papers over to uh, dr isha for your presentation thank you for the elaborate introduction <laughs> so one uh, one more thing kindly everyone please uh, switch off their uh, uh, video uh, there is a chat box on the side of the uh, uh, this uh, screen where you can uh, pin down your uh, 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 remarks as well as question there will be answer question answer section at the end of the section so in between also uh, if uh, we get some interesting uh, questions we will ask in between so over to you isha sir thank you yeah i am sorry uh, for the uh, the technical problem mostly because of my ignorance about the whole thing though i had been using it for quite some time uh, i think uh, before i mean going uh, before, i mean instead of going on the other aspects of it let us come to the topic uh, i was thinking i mean of course you know the, the arnek has given a sexy title to the talk Uh, but of course, you know, elephant conservation issues and challenges. Basically, that will tell the the, the whatever has been mentioned by the uh, in the title uh, by Arunyak. Now, uh, I think you know we should start with the question of why elephants. Elephants, uh, I think, uh, as Dr. Rajiv said, you know, it is the largest uh, land animal. Probably, you can say that African elephant is the largest, uh, and because of the shape, size. and to the intelligence uh we have a, an attraction towards this particular uh, animal in india we have a, we consider it as a heritage animal and uh, it is a keystone species keystone species means it it helps in maintaining the ecosystem contributing to the survival of other species in the system and then uh another aspect is you know this is an animal which requires larger areas and by conserving the larger area we are promoting uh we are making sure that you know we are conserving the entire biodiversity so that that way also it is one of the most important thing the other part is that you know it's a landscape architect uh so that is that means you know it is uh, actually making some alterations in the habitat so that other animals and other uh, groups of animals are also benefited so this is just to say as an introduction and i would uh, straight away go to the the uh, aspects of it now if you look at uh, the elephants of the world we have uh, earlier we used to say that you know in general we say that you know we have african elephant and uh, asian elephant among the african elephants we used to have only loxodonda africana and uh, there was a loxodonda africana africana and loxodonda africana cyclotis now uh, with the various studies and genetic studies and with uh, so many other supporting evidences it has been uh, it is div div divided into two species instead of uh, two subspecies so we have the african elephant the loxodonda cyclotis and the african bush elephant this is african forest elephant and we have the african bush elephant the loxodonda africa so we are leaving it there now the indian elephant among the indian elephant we have elephas maximus indicus which is which we call the the mainland elephants and uh, uh, we have the sri lankan elephant or elephas maximus maximus 
and then sumatran elephant again an island elephas maximus sumatranus and uh, uh, bornean elephants elephas maximus borneensis this the, the difference between these two are not much except pro probably that you know sumatran elephant has uh, 20 ribs instead of 19 ribs uh, when compared to other uh, elephant species or such species now uh, bornean elephant was recently added as a subspecies because you know earlier it is famously uh, known for as a dwarf elephants though it is not that dwarf uh, so but then later the studies you know with uh, molecular evidences suggested that you know it, it deserves a level of a, it deserves the status of a subspecies so elephas maximus borneensis has been erected so so like uh, we have now four subspecies of elephants asian elephants uh, mostly uh, uh, the islands of uh, borneo islands of sumatra islands of sri lanka and then the mainland uh, that is the elephas maximus indicus now let us look at certain characteristic features of these things these elephants it is also known as pachyderm pachyderm there are two uh, animals in the under the category of pachyderm. In fact, there is a journal also called pachyderm. You can access the uh, internet and then download a lot of uh, interesting articles on elephants and rhinoceros. So pachyderm is a is a uh, pachyderm means you know, thick skinned, and uh, but when you say thick skinned, doesn't mean that you no, know, it has a, a uniformly thickness. Uni it is uh, uni uh, thickness is uniformly the same everywhere. If it is uh, on the inside the ears and around mouth and anus, you know, it is paper thin. And uh, uh, only at the back, it's about uh, 2.5 centimeters around the back and then some other parts. But it is very sensitive, like uh, our skin, you know, it is very sensitive and it is uh, uh, with a rich nerve supply. The other aspect, which has some relevance when it comes to the management of elephants in captivity, it doesn't have a sweat gland. It doesn't have a sweat gland so that is another okay and it doesn't have a gallbladder that is another uh, interesting factor about it so since it doesn't have any sweat gland and since it is in the tropical condition and because of these uh, large size you know the metabolic heat produced from the body it has to go have some mechanism to keep itself cool that means you know thermoregulation is very very crucial through behavioral mechanisms and that is why elephants have a tendency to go to water and they apply a uh, lot of uh, mud on the wrinkles of the skin you, if you look at the elephant skin and you know, a lot of wrinkles can be seen so uh, it, it applies you know a lot of uh, uh, mud wet mud and also water in the uh, wrinkles um, in the middle of the in the wrinkles of the body and it is a small surface area compared to its body weight that means less skin area per unit weight so that is also important and that, that again calls for a behavioral mechanism to keep itself cool so thermoregulation is crucial and the elephant spent if you look at elephants you know it spends about a 75 to 95 or 85 percent of the time feeding and it is always on the move and but at the, the in the middle of the day when it is very hot it takes the uh, it goes under the shade to avoid direct sunlight so that is also a mechanism the third one is the the ear fanning of ear we in kerala we feel that you no know, the elephants are fanning their ear uh, uh, appreciating the the drums and other uh, uh, things you know but that is not the case you know when it is very hot it has to keep itself cool and fanning of ear is uh, is also a mechanism for that so valuing is important and mud bath is important and then uh, the sand bath is important and also the, the fanning of uh, ears these are the ways you know by which the elephants are keeping itself cool now the trunk is another uh, versatile organ of, uh, of the elephant and which definitely is another attraction uh, for the animal uh, that is where we said you know the shape of the animal is also interesting it's about uh, it's, it has about 100 uh, 1 lakh 50 thousand units of muscles that itself i mean it's versatile it can hold 8.5 liters of water and it can act as an arm so it can hold water and it uh, helps in feeding so and 
also on defense it's also a part of the defensive mechanism so you have uh, the trunk that is important interesting and if you look at the dentition there are two upper incisors and before we go into that we, the, the third upper incisor is the uh, the uh, more i mean the tusk it is uh, that the third upper incisor is modified into tusk so that too only in the males and uh, in uh, african elephants you have both the males and females with the tusks and among the males in asia we have uh, uh, a good number of uh, males without tusk which we call makana mora in malayalam makana uh, whether these makanas are uh, breeding true yes they breed true and they have uh, even in at least in captivity we have very clear evidences that you know it gives uh, it has uh, fathered uh, a very uh, good tusker so that is also there and now two upper incisors 12 deciduous premolars and 12 molars so a newborn will have two third in one quadrant and then horizontally replaced like a conveyor belt this is a most interesting part of it like a conveyor belt you, it it is pushing the when the uh, when one is uh, uh, no more in use or uh, it's already worn out then the new one is replaced uh, first one is replaced at the age of uh, uh, two to three years second one at uh, four to six years third one at uh, nine to fifteen years and for so likewise uh, there is a, a conveyor belt acting pushing the teeth from behind so this is again an interesting part of it now if you look at uh, african elephants uh, you can see the tusk. There has been record of uh, the uh, heaviest is uh, 3.264 meter and uh, 1.102.7 uh, uh, kilogram. Among the Asian elephants, you know, it's about 3.02 and uh, 39 kilogram weight. This varies. You know, this is only a statistics, and probably this this can maybe this is wrong by this time. Uh, maybe there is another elephant, you know, with uh, heavy. Uh, task. Now coming to the uh, the brain, this is also very very interesting. Uh, about 5.5 to 6.5 kg. So there is a possibility of greater information processing, uh, and you know, but at the cost of uh, high metabolic uh, investment, and the social complexity is also reflected in the in the uh, complexity of the the brain. So uh, if you look at uh, the about 257 billion neurons are there in the in the brain and uh, if you look at the brain size 35 percent of the uh, when it is a, a calf is born it has only 35 percent of the weight of the adult brain which means that uh, the the baby is grown only through learning while growing you know it is learning that is why elephants have uh, a very complex uh, a very long, uh, prolonged juvenile stage, and also the subadult stage. You can probably say that also. And uh, the most interesting part, you know, when you are talking about the intelligence and uh, related to emo emotions, you know, he this uh, neurons, synapses, and also highly developed hippocampus is one of the peculiarities of the elephants. Maybe that helps in memorizing things, and you know, that helps in the, in the whole life so that they can remember the resources available resources where is the available resources and also that is why we say that you no know, elephants uh, are emotionally uh, like uh, human beings so that is another aspect of it now reproduction if you look at reproduction again interesting because testis is inside near the kidneys and penis is about uh, one meter long and 16 centimeter diameter when erect, you know, it has a shape of S shape, uh, and the vulval opening in the female is between. Uh, it is located between the female's hind legs. This is where uh, probably a makana. How to identify a makana from a tusca? I mean, from a female. This is a question you now which is normally raised. And if you look at uh, the makana population, the proportion of makana population in Sri Lanka, it's around 70 to 80 percent of the males are makanas. We also have several uh, makanas. Now, why do we have so much of why do we uh, have so much of makanas in the population? It is said a, a normal common sense uh, uh, interpretation or explanation is that you know it is also to escape from the 
from the poaching, the pressure uh, on the male population. That is only one part of it. Possible that you know it is evolving now, and you know we may get more of elephants, uh, more of makanas in the population. Uh, so th there are several uh, very 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 few studies have been conducted on the, the genetics of it. So uh, we are yet to know more about uh, the difference between a makana and the normal tusca. So uh, yeah, and the gestation period is about 18 to 22 months. So one of the longest. That means this means that you know there has been report of uh, delivery at the at the uh, 18 months and also at, uh, 22 months. So and very rarely we get twins. You know this is a twins born in uh, captivity in uh, Tamil Nadu top slip uh, Varagalia elephant camp long back in '83. Uh, and estrus is 13 to 17 be, uh, weeks. And in the birth interval is three to seven years. When you are talking about population dynamics, you know how much, how how the how the population is growing. These aspects are important. That they, especially that the interval, interbirth interval, it's three to seven years. And the the calf is going on feeding on the milk for about two, three to four years. And in captivity, we normally uh, wean out the calf. Wean out means separate the calf from the. Uh, from the mother at the age of three or four, depending on the the, the uh, owner or depending on the size of the calf and the, the relationship between the calf and the mother. Uh, and you know that, you know, this is a social animal. And it follows a social animal's mean and it, it is the leader in the herd is the female. And that is why we call it as a matriarchal system. We have a matriarchal system and the oldest female is leading the herd so it's a female centered uh, system where sisters and kids you can probably call it like that you have uh, the uh, the males the females and uh, you have the adults sub adults juveniles and calves and then larger herds sometimes you know there could be larger herds i have seen herds of 70 and maybe somebody in the company can definitely say that you know, they have seen more than that so larger, it's an aggregation of smaller herds, and larger herds split into two or more uh, related herds. You know, so they, they are related. This is a mechanism to avoid competition for food during stress period. But if you look at Kabini, then you have uh, more animals, and there is a uh, the competition is much more than you can think of in other places. So this may need a, a, a revisit this uh, statement. So the, the split herd, uh, the members of the split herd rejoin maybe after several hours or after several days. And uh, so several of uh, these related herds together form a clan. So females are permanent members while males move out. We will come to that more about uh, it on the other one. And uh, normally uh, the unrelated herds keep away with each other. Uh, based on the aggressiveness and uh, other uh, behavioral aspects. Sexual maturity of female is at uh, the age of uh, 10 to 15 years. And at this stage, you know, they may mate and stay in the herd. Easter cycle, last we have already mentioned about it. And uh, males locate the Easter's female. And there is something called Flemin response. We, this will again come later. Flemin response, as uh, somebody has been explaining it in the case of uh, uh, snakes, the, the the females, and we, we used to have uh, such observations among the goat also. That you know they they put their uh, uh, trunk. They use the trunk and the vulva, and then smell it, and then take it to the mouth, and you have the Jacobson's organ inside. So that is the uh, that is how the elephant, uh, the male, will uh, understand whether the animal is in uh, receptive mood, and you know whether it can go for mating so uh, the normal sex ratio uh, of uh, this is something very interesting we will come to that again because skewed sex ratio is one of the topics you know which is being debated and which is being discussed uh, in several places so uh, where do they give birth you know they can be mostly in the within the herd but sometimes you know they just move away from the uh, herd also so about the calves, 
at the birth you know it is about 9200 kg and uh, uh, a male calf is slightly uh, heavier with uh, about 120 kg possibilities so uh, relatively short trunk and it's very interesting to make up i mean observe the the uh, the baby the calf uh, just waving the uh, the trunk and you know, not knowing what to do exactly with that so tigers and crocodiles are threat to elephant calves you know wherever there is uh, a, a calf with the herd definitely you can see the pug mark behind the herd you know pug mark of a tiger uh, so that is a very good possible and in, in african conditions you must have seen the movies you know where uh, the crocodiles are going for uh, elephants so within 6 years the calves grow faster and weigh up to 110 and 3 to 5 years it can suckle and sometimes you can see uh, the the care of the calf is the business of the complete uh, herd so it's not just the mother if the mother is likely moving out from the from the group uh, for feeding or something then definitely others will take care of allo mothering you know that is what is known as allo mothering so that is uh, something very interesting and it gives a better protection to the calf so calf you calf is the the owner uh, owned by everybody in the in the uh, in the herd uh, so sometimes you know you can see the mothers you know uh, they give access to other baby also from their herd uh, so that that's again very very interesting fact about this and young bulls if you look at uh, the bulls in the in the herd at the age of 10 to 15 years old they they reach sexual maturity but at the age of uh, around 9 they go out they start moving out uh, so 9 to 10 uh, they start moving out and then may join uh, herds join a bachelor herd so that is a possibility and if you look at this this is also because the uh, the males have to learn a lot from the other males so there is uh, the there is a uh, group i mean uh, uh, the adolescent males have to learn from the company of the adult males and they go uh, and make company with the uh, the bachelors i always say that it's like human beings you know most of us most of the males from the family will go out and make company and they may reach they may come back and return home only late at night so adolescent males they are in the company of uh, here there is a temporary hierarchy this is not a permanent one so there will be a leader here and the the largest adult males form the bachelor herd uh, i think you know there was a uh, video in uh, uh, social media showing uh, some 10 or 11 uh, uh, bachelor herds at uh, of uh, 10 to 11 uh, tusk moving in the in karnataka uh, i think it was huzur or somewhere near karnataka it was there so but there is a problem and if you look at human wildlife conflict issues you will find that you know these are the the bachelor herds are responsible for uh, most of the uh, crop riding and uh, most of the uh, naughty behavior and there could be uh, what you call uh, habitual crop riders habitual offenders could be there so what is being done i mean this is out of context from this talk but still uh the, the male uh, the the adult bull which is considered to be the leader of the bachelor herd will be captured and bring it to captivity or mostly bring it to captivity so that will break the chain and you know the others will be just an obedient boy so that's very very interesting now adult bulls have its own territory like uh, uh, they they mix with uh, they go from herd to herd this is a mechanism to avoid inbreeding if they are confined to the herd itself there is a possibility that you know they will be mating with their own siblings and you know they will have all the problems of inbreeding so genetic problems will come there and then uh, so most of the elephants you know they come to musk at the age of 15 or 20 years uh, we have uh, in attention captivity we say that you now we have a pre musk period when when the uh, so when the temporal gland is swollen and then 
we have a yeah happens yeah we have a primus period when the temporal gland is swollen temporal gland you know this is the the location that is between the eye and the ear there is the temporal this is the temporal region and there is a gland a uh, temporal gland and temporal gland comes it swells during a particular period and it may uh, then it will start oozing out a phenolic smelling uh, uh, liquid and we say that the elephant is in must uh, then uh, in captivity we say that there is a pre must and must and then post must period and the, the uh, when they grow older the period of must also increases uh, there are elephants you know which comes into must one uh, twice in a year i mean twice in a in a year or uh, the, the periodicity and everything differs you know according to the individual now must males will wander for in search of the the estrus females and uh, so there is a lot of energy spent for that and uh, spent less time for feeding and more time on moving and uh, there is a possibility that they are considered to be the dominant one uh, and the the possibility of mating by a must elephant is much more than a non must uh, male elephant so it is considered to be more aggressive but there are cases say there was an elephant called ig inspector general of elephants in 81 when i went to tamil nadu elephant camp in uh, near top slip this ig was in must and at that time it was 65 years old and this fellow uh, on the top of this ig which was in must there was a boy sitting uh, around the 6 to 7 year old boy the, the son of a uh, mahavat sitting and controlling the elephant and taking it to water for bathing that was very very interesting and something new to me because uh, we used to see the elephants in captivity here and the elephants with the help of uh, dr krishnamurthy the famous uh, elephant doctor of tamil nadu with the help of dr krishnamurthy i could squeeze the the must gland secretion directly using my own hand from this elephant and then i did uh, some chemical analysis to know what is there whether there is any difference um, in the uh, chemical composition where in the uh, must of uh, must gland secretion of elef african elephant and asian there was not uh, volatiles i was looking at the volatiles now uh, what is the purpose of this it is acting as a pheromone it is a sort of chemical communication and you can see these animals you know moving and then uh, occasionally rubbing uh on the trees or uh, branches you know uh, it is basically uh advertising that you know i am here and i am the dominant and always the dominant males in must the males uh, the must elephants in uh, when they are uh, the dominance is definitely accepted by other animals <coughs> so what i said is that um, the, the, the males in must need not be aggressive there was an elephant in uh, i think it is still there in trichur no which is not aggressive during must but a fear is there among the mahavat that you no know, an elephant in must is not approachable so that is a that's a problem and if you look at the size uh, the the must elephants with a large size you know is definitely a problem i had uh, another experience in uh, wynad when we we were trying to capture an uh, elephant a male elephant uh, and then go for uh, attaching fixing radio transmitter that is a radio collar this was in uh, i think it was in the beginning of 2000 and uh, we were using an elephant called a mudumalayan uh, which is considered to be a kunki kunki means you know the elephant which is trained uh, to capture uh, elephant from the wild so we were uh, we were damn sure and we were uh, uh, happy that you no know, we have mudumalayan with us so if anything goes wrong you know that fellow will take care of us uh, but and there were uh, there was a veterinarian and there was another a research fellow of mine you now was sitting on the top of mudumalayan while moving and suddenly mudumalayan started running uh, and you know he he started to retreat we didn't know exactly what was happening and suddenly we saw that there was an elephant in must so an elephant in must is feared even by the very well trained kunki so that's the power of uh, a must elephant even in the wild so that's a possibility
Now looking at uh, the, the food of uh, elephants, I have uh, observed around 185 species of plants, mostly uh, grass, dominated by grass, it means, you know, the, the largest grass is, of course, the bamboo, and the bamboo form, bamboo and other grass species uh, is uh, the dominant uh, food species of elephants. And of course, you know, uh, this has also some relevance when it comes to captivity, just to remind you on that. So this is also very, very crucial. And uh, if you look at this, they go for shrubs, especially Helictris isora, the, uh, what is it called? I mean, in Malayalam, there is a name for that. Helictris isora. That is also a favorite of this. They go for debarking. Now, is there any seasonality in the debarking? And why do they go for debarking? Uh, seasonality, of course, you know, whenever there is a uh, dry, during dry period also it goes, you know, but you can see them feeding on the bark of uh, some of the trees, even during uh, rainy season or wet season. I had gone for an analysis of uh, the uh, grass species, the food species that comes under the grass and also the bark during the similar period. And I found that most of these animals are going for bark when there is a uh, reduced quantity of uh, calcium and potassium uh, in the grass species, and uh, which is available in the, and in addition to that, there are some other minerals also, which is more in the uh, bark. So it is definitely, and it is especially true in the case of uh, the males, you know, which has to have more calcium for uh, maintaining the tusk. So that is another one. Now coming to the communication, it can be, we have already mentioned about one of the basic uh, uh, communication mechanism that is the must among the males. It can be through touch, that means not tactile, or it can be through taste, or it can be through smell, vision, and uh, uh, so olfactory and auditory and all those possibilities are there. Tactiles, mostly it helps female, uh, the family bonding. And it is mostly between the, the adults and you know, subadults or juveniles. So that is, uh, and it can touch anywhere in the body. And you know, it is definitely, we also do that. You know, so definitely, you know, the must, which we have already mentioned, you know, this is a, also a mechanism, uh, a chemical communication mechanism, which I have already mentioned. I was searching for this slide in the earlier one. Anyway, so we have that. And then chemical communication, the flamen response, which I had been mentioning, that is a, uh, a temporal gland secretion is also there. And you know the, the flamen response, the, 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 the chemical uh, uh, cue they get from the vulva uh, also helps in mating and you know, identifying the animal, uh, the female, which is receptive. And one of the advantages of having this chemical communication, you now this lasts for a long enough period and function, uh, then it can, I mean, longer distance, you know, it can uh, travel. So that is one of the advantages of uh, chemical uh, communication. Now, acoustic communication is very, very much, much more complex than what we can think. You, if you look at uh, the elephants, if they, you have, a, we are more familiar with the trumpeting, uh, and it can go up to infrasonic uh, calls mostly produced by larynx or modified by the resonance of the trunk. So there, there are, if you look at uh, the, the communication, the infrasound communication, which is very, very, very interesting. Uh, this is uh, from a frequency of uh, 4 to 15 hertz, this infrasound communication. The sound is of frequency of about 4 to 15 hertz. And this frequency is very low and uh, cannot be heard by us so and this sound it can travel up to 300 more than 300 kilometers there was a lady who had been working on this uh, there is a website you can go to the website elephant listening there is a website which will give a lot of information on the experiments which they have conducted they had recorded this infrasonic sound uh, with a uh, infrasounds you know which is uh, uh, using a, 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 a uh, I think, you know, a mechanism uh, developed only for that. And then they replayed it and they could bring back 
a related uh, animal from far away places. So that is the sort of thing. One advantage of uh, the low frequency sound is that you no, know, it can pass through thick vegetation with a, without much loss. So that is an advantage. Maybe that is why the elephants have developed this low frequency sound for communication. Now in studies in Africa, if you look at the sounds produced, there are 26 calls uh, produced by adults and of which 19 are produced only by females and four only by males. And there is a, uh, there are three types of calls which are produced by both the sexes. Uh, I'm not uh, trying to uh, call, play these calls because it can lead to another complication. So I don't want to delay it further. Now, how much area is required? So you have the, the chemical communication and you have the auditory communication and you have the tactile communication. Now, whoever is uh, actually observing an elephant herd in the in the wild, you will see that uh, the herd you know, without any touch, without any other sound mechanism, we will see that they move together all on a sudden and they stop all on a sudden. They, all these are happening because of the infrasound communication. So there, there is a communication without our knowledge or with, uh, which we cannot hear. Now, how much area is required uh, by the elephant? So what is the home range size? That means you no. Know, Home range is the, the area utilized by an animal for its uh, water, uh, for its uh, resource requirements like water, food, or maybe other shade and everything. So shelter, which we, people now sometimes call it a shelter also. So there have been some studies in different places uh, to see how much area is required. But from these studies only we come to know that you know, elephants are vagabonds. They, they move a lot and they need larger areas and if they remain in one area there are studies from africa where the elephants have converted their own habitat into deserts without i mean killing all the plant resources available and you know the elephants have to starve and they go for crop riding so there are such uh, uh, observations from africa in our case you know such studies have not been I mean, such observations have, uh, I mean, observations have not yielded such results. Uh, but if you look at this annual seasonal home range, annual and seasonal home range size had been uh, studied in uh, Rajaji National Park, and now Rajaji Tiger Reserve in Uttarakhand, where uh, they have found that you know, the males have around uh, annual home range is around 200. And uh, that means, you know, the males are moving a lot even during wet season and also the other seasons. And the females are uh, using only 34 square kilometers. So that, that's a sort of uh, uh, range used. Now we will come to the, the other aspect of it. Now, if you look at here, you will see, you will see that you now in uh, Mudumale, uh, I think, you know, Mudumale was the first place to go for a, uh, study on home range using radio caller and we had very, very interesting experiences from that at the time of uh, radio call ring in Mudumale. Uh, this was in 90s and uh, Priyanka, I mean they have uh, her named the herd also you now uh, from where uh, from which you know they had uh, radio called one female and Harini and then the Wendy and Salimari a subadult male and then Natmiral an adult male. Now, all these observations have shown that it uses, say, for example, the herds are using 623.4 kilometers, square kilometers. And uh, in another, it is 799. So it has something to do with the herd size and also the resource availability. So the, this is the sort of uh, uh, observations. And surprisingly, the adult male, male admiral was using only uh, 210.6 uh, square kilometers. That means, you know, it was much, much smaller. But I heard, you know, which is uh, radio called in Mudumale was later uh, recorded from Anagati. So, and uh, and also from our, uh, uh, from nearer to Atapadi, we have seen that. And I have uh, seen a, a elephant with a radio caller, which was not functional, uh, which was no more functional in uh, Vainad, in the interior of Vainad, I have seen that. So, this has something to do, this is very, very interesting, you know, the, why the subadult male has, you know, larger herds, uh, larger area, home range size, and, you know, the admiral 
has only 210. Maybe because it has something to do with the density. Just, I will call it as density dependent to some extent. And then uh, our study in uh, my study is in Parambukulam uh, it, uh, out of 226 locations. That means 226 observations, 226 days I have sighted these animals. 124.3 square kilometer. In another one, uh, we had 156.6 square kilometer. Now, what are the factors that is affecting the home range size? I found at least in uh, Perambuklam, and you know, these similar observations are made from other places also. The the with the uh, dry season approaching, the animals are confined to nearer to the water holes. That means you know water is a an important factor deciding on the home range size. And as the monsoon sets in and you know when it is starts raining, the animal starts moving away from the water hole because there is definitely availability of water all over the places. Second factor is the food availability. If you look at uh, the dry areas or uh, uh, moist, uh, if you look at uh, say the areas, the conservation areas with the more of evergreen forest, the animal has to travel a lot in search of food because elephants have a preference for dry deciduous and the moist deciduous forest with a lot of grass undergrowth and also it has the enough food in those areas in such vegetations. Whereas in the case of uh, in the evergreens, it doesn't have that much uh, uh, food, so it has to travel a lot. So it depends on the water availability and depends on the vegetation types. So the home range size varies according to the vegetation types and according to the water availability in that particular area. So this is something very, very interesting. And a lot of these have been used. Uh, there had been recently, there had been some studies in uh, some uh, animals were radio colored in, uh, in Mo. Yeah, in uh, uh, Wayanad also. Now this means that elephants need larger area. This is this can be taken as a reason to conserve, because if you are conserving larger areas, you are conserving a larger part of the biodiversity in that area. So elephants need larger areas uh, for its day-to-day -day requirement, for its resources, for food, water and other resources. So this is one of the reasons you know, for, to say that the elephants should have more disturbance-free, contiguous uh, elephant habitat for conservation. Now, what is the status of the elephants in the wild? Presently, it is found in 13, we call it as the range states of elephant range states. And estimate is around uh, uh, 40 to 47,000. Let us say that now we will have now around uh, uh, 47 to 50,000 all over Asia. This is likely I have to update it. But currently, India has the largest population of around 29 to 30,000. And uh, uh, the next one may be the Sri Lanka with a slight variation in the figure. But the most interesting fact about all these things, if you look at uh, some of these areas, you know, say, for example, China, 165 to 213 is the population estimation for China. And uh, for Bangladesh, it is 201 to 218. And if you look at Cambodia, around 1,000, around 1,000. This is not based on a uh, scientifically sound estimate. We can probably call so that some of these places have only estimates. So Laos, 567. So what is the status of these things? What is the long-term conservation possibilities uh, for these uh, uh, populations? With such small population, we have something called a minimum viable population. For any, any species, we need a minimum viable population. In the case of mammals, we say that we should have a minimum of 500 in different herds or uh, different groups. So, and with an ideal sex ratio of one is to one. This is another uh, conditions. So, if you look at uh, most of these, the, the chances of uh, conserving these animals in some of these range state is definitely very bad. This will tell you exactly what is the situation. This is our uh, uh, the best population. We can say that you know, uh, Asian elephant distribution. And this is a South Indian population. And we have the South, uh, I mean, the Northwest population, 
and we have the central india or probably we can call it as east india population and the northeast population and you know we have and this is sumatra <coughs> now this definitely say that the, the population is highly fragmented the population the, the the population doesn't have larger contiguous areas for long term conservation this is i will again call it as only a potato map because if you visit some of these areas again this will be you will see that it is further fragmented it is further fragmented and some of the populations are uh, further isolated uh, when i went to sumatra to make an assessment for international fund for animal welfare to make an assessment of elephant population and requirements in sumatra i found um, one fellow one forest officer came and told me that oh we have a population i said how many are there two that's all two elephant population in that particular habitat because the entire the other rest of the area is gone and i'm sure that now they are going to capture this and then take it to uh, tourism in uh, their uh, uh, other islands or in our uh, famous places in uh, indonesia bali that is the the destination of uh, or destination fate of uh, some of these elephants now look at china i said you know, 165 to 230 elephants here this is in yunnan reserve that means in the the southern part of china you have the elephant population historical range say that you no know, it was here it was here and it was here but currently we have only these uh, so these 165 to 230 say let us say that around 200 elephants are in uh, are in five populations and we don't know what exactly is going to happen especially in china where there is a lot of demand for for the ivory and even for the meat and for the skin so everything is there now bangladesh uh, we have uh, some uh, some connection through meghalaya to bangladesh so elephant movement is there between bangladesh and meghalaya with some problems because you know we have also gone for fencing of uh, the boundary but still elephants manage and uh, here also around 200 to 250 elephants say let us see these are the areas you know of uh, elephant distribution a lot of issues are there and more of these are again going because there are movements of uh, uh, movements of refugees from myanmar and then clearing these areas to accommodate the refugees from myanmar uh, the rohingya so that is also one of the issues now bhutan of course you know has something very interesting because you know it has some connectivity with the manas tiger reserve of india and in most of the areas you know they have connectivity with the india so that way the, even the population even if the population is small and even if the population is confined to certain areas there is a possibility of at least one uh, or two uh, uh, populations for for uh, long term survival elephant distribution in sri lanka this is uh, again very interesting because you know the the elephant distribution is here you can see uh, because of the the uh, civil war and the issues there they have lost not only elephants you know they have lost a lot of uh, elephant areas habitat so there is a problem there but they are currently making an attempt to bring it back to the normal state hopefully they will do that malaysia uh we i mean i uh, when i went through the forests of malaysia you know, in search of the elephant areas i was just uh, thinking of uh, the attitude of the indians we have stopped clear filling we have stopped clear filling of the forest we have stopped selection filling of the forest and we said okay we will get we will meet our requirement from the malaysian timber so we are actually promoting uh, conversion of uh, elephant habitat and uh, wildlife habitat in malaysia so this is the distribution of elephants very interesting because uh, the elephants are i mean the habitat is being converted into oil palm or rubber and the elephants in that area will be captured and translocated to another area which is known as taman nagara that means a national park where they say that elephants are safe there was actually a team uh, to capture these animals and then translocate it that's that's an interesting part of it so the translocation program 
was one of the major programs of elephant, what they call elephant conservation, which cannot be. Uh, but habitat has, has been going. You look at Thailand, you know, I'm showing these, you know, just to say that when we say that elephants, uh, around 50,000 elephants, and you know, most of us will feel that, okay, we have enough of elephants. No, all these elephants are under threat. And because of this fragmented population, even if we, even what is the status, I mean, uh, what is the criteria to decide whether a species is endangered or not? The major criteria is not just the number. It is also the number. If the number is decreasing, definitely it is becoming endangered. But even if you have larger population, size of 50,000, how many fragments, how many, uh, where do they live? In how many fragments? If it is fragmented, if the habitat is fragmented, that is another criteria to say whether the animal is endangered or not. So in Thailand, you know, you look at this. These are the areas, wild elephant population at the, at the present. Very, very interesting because you know, a lot of people are uh, working in most of these areas. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, some of the NGOs are also working, WCS, and you know, there are uh, Thailand-based organizations, international organizations working in these areas. Uh, but they have uh, another problem also. The Cambodian people are complaining that the Thai, Thai guys come to their border and they are poaching, not poaching, they are actually capturing their calves and then take it back to Thailand for uh, <coughs> tourism industry. The same complaint is there from Laos also, you know, where, from where these Thai people go and then uh, poach the elephants, you know, for uh, tourism industry in Thailand. So when we say that, okay, how beautifully the uh, elephants are being used in tourism industry, remember, there is, it is at a cost, which uh, Gina Srinivasan was mentioning it yesterday. It is at a cost. It is at a cost of a, an elephant somewhere. Or it is at the cost of a habitat somewhere. And it may be sometimes it is at the cost of the well-being of the elephants uh, somewhere. So this has to be borne in mind that whenever we are talking about it. Uh, when I went to these areas, you know, I found that they, their complaints are almost correct. That you know, there are uh, 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 instances which uh, Thai people, Thai officials also agreed that there are problems and uh, our people go and then capture it. This is a Sumatran uh, pick. Sumatra is the only place in Indonesia, you know, where other than probably the, the Borneo uh, of uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. So this is the fate of it. And from every these, see, these places, all these places, you have very, very small populations and they are still going on converting their habitat for oil palm mostly for oil palm and then for other developments. So this is the place, you know, Aceh, where uh, the tsunami hit first. Laos, again, population estimation is 560. And you look at the elephant landscape. Here is it. All these are highly scattered. So the scope for long-term conservation is doubtful. But we are not ruling out the possibilities of bringing it back to normalcy. Because, say, for example, in uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, the uh, Asian Elephant Species Group, of which I am a member, Asian Elephant Species Group has offered the expertise of people and also resources for conserving these uh, animals in Cambodia. Cambodia also has a uh, cardamom uh, hill reserve. Interesting, you know, we also have it in Munar, nearer to Munar, it is Kadavam Hill Reserve, which we call CHR. And uh, Cambodia also has the same problems uh, with uh, uh, elephants uh, getting uh, deprived of the habitat. And, you know, they have the problems. So there was an attempt in 2003 by Lim Greba and uh, his team using GIS. It's not based on any field uh, uh, based assessment, but they used GIS in combination with the satellite data and uh, other digital maps to see where, where is the place in Asia where you have uh, unfragmented or uh, contiguous areas, wild lands that could be best habitat for elephants. So which are the priority areas you know, where you can probably go for investing for conservation, conserving elephants? And what proportion of these fragmented, unfragmented or contiguous areas are 
coming under protected area under sanctuaries national park or biosphere reserve so and also uh, whether there is uh, uh, possibilities of long term conservation in these uh, unfragmented or uh, contiguous areas there are a few assumptions you know when they considered this one is definitely that uh, long term elephant conservation requires large wild lands we have seen that the, the elephants need larger areas you know for conservation and elephants live in a variety of wild land habitats that means you know they are adapted to a different type of habitat though with a preference for deciduous uh, forest and grasslands and then frequent fire is an indicator of disturbance and increased the human activity that means frequent fire they have considered as a negative point while considering the areas for long term conservation linear infrastructure meaning the roads the rails and other uh, intrusions into the wilderness has been considered as a as an indicator of human development which is leading to fragmentation of wild lands and the smaller or uh, more fragmented wildland area are less suitable for elephants that means uh, only very few can be supported very few elephants can be supported by smaller uh, uh, smaller fragments so which means that you know that also may not be considered for a long term conservation now what is the what is the outcome of that study the outcome is that the largest single population of elephants in the whole of asia is in south india that is starting from brahmagiri to eastern ghats comprising nilgiris of tamil nadu bandipura nagarhole wayanad then uh, nilgiris include definitely the mudumalai and you know then brt which is a tiger reserve biligiri rangasami temple sanctuary or tiger reserve and satyamangalam kollegal hosur dharmapuri this is the largest area with around 12600 square kilometers and has a large area under protection that means we have a number of protected areas protected area means you know the sanctuaries national parks and this is also having diverse vegetation types starting from the the scrub jungles through the deciduous forest to the evergreens and up to the grassland shola systems of nilgiris so diversity of vegetation and uh, the extent of area and then you have uh, the number of uh, the larger number of protected areas and around 6300 uh, uh, elephants so this is the best and you have a minimum viable population not uh, and you have a, a larger critical minimum area everything is assured here but even within this say you know at least uh, in some places in wayanad uh, and in some places in uh, uh, satyamangalam and other places we do have the pressure from the development and we do have pressure from the settlements but still this is considered to be one of the best and probably that is our concern that you know we should remain or we should retain the status of having the largest single population and the largest elephant habitat in the whole of asia now what is the other challenge definitely i had been mentioning all over uh, over and over that you know the habitat conversion and leading to urbanization especially in hilly areas and in other places even in other places also so this is from nagaland you can see that urbanization they, they are encroaching this is true in the case of other places also if you take assam and if you take uh, meghalaya the northeast and uh, you have other places also urbanization that is uh, for habitat conversion for urbanization it doesn't end there once an urban area comes you will have more influx of people from the nearby areas for in search of job and you we will have more and more developmental activities in the form of uh, factories and uh, other uh, infrastructure habitat conversion for industrial purpose had been mentioning about this this is definitely from uh, malaysia uh, where you know, they are converting most of these areas into uh, the you know, oil palm uh, industry and we are also responsible we are the consumers of a very good uh, quantity of uh, oil palm i mean palm oil and elephants are crammed into smaller areas this is something interesting this is a photograph by kalyan verma uh, the famous photographer and you know this is definitely a problem we have already converted and these areas are currently 
being used by elephants as a as a passage from one habitat to the nearby habitat it doesn't provide food it doesn't provide shade but it is crammed this is happening not only with the tea estates or any other estates this is also happening this is the case of from valpare but this is also happening in northern bengal this is also happening in some of the places near kaziranga you have a lot of tea estates and you know, this is happening in uh, tinsukia or uh, in assam again and this is happening in uh, different places in addition to that we have also other developmental activities happening dominant human dominated landscapes like attapadi in kerala human dominated landscapes whether it is of the elephants or the whether, whether it is of the human beings nobody knows everybody has a feeling that it is mine elephants also feel that it is mine and that is why you have more problems in areas like attapadi or like muna we have such issues so elephants are just using these areas for passage now land use and land change land cover change if you look at uh, the changes in land use practices this is an example from devikulam where you have the problems of uh, human wildlife conflict in ana irangal that means uh, this is nearer to muna on the way from muna to shantambara you will see ana irangal reservoir where uh, the government of kerala has gone for promoting uh, tourism yes so it's a very very difficult situation now uh, you have to be very careful when you are thinking about tourism and that too in the name of eco tourism which is need not be eco tourism it's only an echo you are calling now this is a 1975 map of this particular area the the land use map of uh, uh, devikulam and adjacent areas this is 1995 if you look at this it is gone most of these areas have come under either plantation plantation by government plantation by uh, private people and then agricultural areas so there is a lot of change uh, happening in this area and by 2015 complete fragmentation so fragmentation of natural habitat in addition there had been these areas have been especially anai rangal around the anai rangal reservoir lot of areas have been assigned to adivasis in the name of adivasis and the adivasis are now trying saying that we are getting fed up with the wildlife conflict and we should be shifted so we are if you look at uh, these uh, the land use or land cover map of any area for over a period of time you will get the same picture so lot of changes in the land use has happened and fragmenting the natural habitat and look at this you know this completely gone and you have forest only in some places and that to discontinuous in addition to that you have also converted some of these areas for resorts and resorts means further disturbance a lot of roads to the resorts and a lot of movement during day and night so what happens then are we not supposed to connect these fragments you have a fragment here a larger habitat you have another larger habitat here and this is the only connecting link you have so what happens unless and until if such a situation exists and if elephants are managing to pass through this connecting link this such a narrow fragment of forest or narrow fragment of habitat then we are supposed to maintain this and this is known as the corridor the elephant corridor so you can suppose you have a you have you think of your hostel where you have rooms on both side of the corridor and if you consider each room as a habitat and if you want to move from one habitat one room to the other habitat unless you have that corridor you are stuck and the animals will be confined to this without this so there are such problems all over and this is the elephant corridors of central india the the uh, the corridors have also been identified uh, with the help of uh, uh, maps and with the field verifications and there is a book called right of passage uh, with the wildlife trust of india has published and i used to be the author of the first edition and uh, uh, and then uh, identified or recognized uh, approved by the project elephant steering committee and supreme court said there should be enough action to protect to give legal 
uh, protection to these corridors so that further developments that do not happen and the elephants can move freely through these identified elephant corridors. This is the North and West Bengal. The number of corridor is also an indication of fragmentation, the extent of fragmentation. You can see this very, very interesting because the more uh, the, the more the development is happening, you know, the more the, con uh, the fragmentation and the more number of uh, uh, elephant corridors. This is in a part of South India, in Tamil Nadu and, you know, part of Karnataka. And we have it in Kerala also, you know, some of these corridors have been identified. In some cases, we have, uh, we have been successful to uh, secure these corridors through acquisition and in some cases through by dialogue with the people. And deforestation. So traditional practices, this is, uh, you cannot say that this is a currently practiced everywhere in the Northeast, but in Manipur, in Jharkhand, I mean Manipur, in Meghalaya, and uh, uh, Meghalaya, Manipur, Tripura, all these places, this used to be the practices, which is known as zooming. Uh, that means, you know, they will cut this forest area and they will go for cultivation and then move after the, after the harvesting, they will move to another area and they will go for uh, cultivation in that areas. Normally, they return to this area after this uh, gets restored into the natural ones after maybe 10 years, 15 years. But now, because of the population pressure, the human population pressure, they are uh, they are forced to return faster, maybe within three years. You know, so naturally there is no rest or there is no chance for these uh, these places to get restored to its natural state. I said about plant use pattern. And this is the Ana Irangal story in Kerala. This is the place, you know, where Elif Ana Irangal means, you know, definitely you can understand from the name itself. So the, the surrounding area has been now given to people for cultivation. No cultivation is happening and there is conflict and there is a conflict between the people and the forest department officials and with the government also. The other one is the linear infrastructure, the rails, the roads. They fragment and kills. This is some of the uh, the tragedy stories. This mostly it is happening in uh, northern Bengal, and then rarely happens in uh, uh, Walayar places like Walayar in Kerala. Very very rarely uh, compared to Assam. It used to be a common feature in Rajaji National Park, but there was an intervention, and there had been a lot of work being done and looked at the reasons why the elephants grows. And this problem was uh, problem was solved uh, with the help of both the railway and with the forest department. And you know, the, it was animal was crossing and basically for water to the other area. And in the process, uh, the elephant was getting killed. So we may have to go for a study on these things and then go for solutions, site specific solutions. The elephants are also getting disturbed, and uh, its communication is uh, disturbed because of the fragmentation of the habitat. It is mostly diesel dominated or petrol dominated uh, communication that is possible. Chemical communication is completely ruled out. And you know, the other thing is, uh, this is the other issue which we have. So a lot of issues are happening. Development projects. I don't say that this is a rule, but this happens, especially in areas where you have careless implementation and nobody is bothered about the maintenance from the power lane. This, uh, the elephants are getting killed, electrocuted. I don't say that it is purposefully done, but careless. So you can probably call it as a purposeful. Is there any other uh, predator, uh, predator for elephants being the large size and other things? Very, very difficult. This is a camera trap uh, uh, picture I got from Silent Valley. Uh, this is of a juvenile elephant killed by tiger and then it, that fellow was feeding on that. Since it is Silent Valley and since the forest officials are aware that you are not supposed to remove the, the carcass of a tiger, they didn't remove it and they got good pictures also from that. So the only predator other than the human being is the tiger. That's all. And that is quite natural. We don't have to worry about it. That's why I said, you know, after any, any herd, you know, any herd with a calf is vigilant against such predation possibilities. The cubed sex ratio we had been talking about. I talked about the the, uh, the predator, the human predator, and the skewed sex ratio. It has been observed that in captivity, uh, from captivity, we understand that 
uh, during the birth, it is one is to one. Sex ratio is one is to one. But in wild, we know we don't know what is the sex ratio during birth. But we know that the sex ratio is skewed, and you have more females than the males. Are we really worried? I don't think that we must be too much worried. But the reason we should be worried, it is. It should not be. Uh, it should be natural. It should not be because of poaching. It should not be because you know somebody had to remove the uh, the uh, task in, in a very cruel manner. Not only cruel manner, but there you could remove it in a uncruel manner also. It's not fair. So that will be an intervention among the in the on the natural population. So skewed sex ratio because you know when we are more bothered about sex ratio uh, among the elephants. Are we not worried about the sex ratio in the in the case of cow? Are we not worried about in the case of uh, the sex ratio in the case of uh, Sambadia? If you look at most of the herbivores, the sex ratio is definitely favoring females, and you have more number of females than males. And you know that may be the rules of the rule in the nature. But if you are uh, purposefully removing the animals, either for ivory ivory trade or because of capture. This is another interesting factor. Wherever you go, look at the ecological history of that area. What has happened in the past, or you can probably say natural history or ecological history. Look at uh, uh, the writings in the gazetteers. Look at uh, the books written by other people. So the older, uh, olden uh, British days. You know how many people have? A lot of people have written uh, their observations, and we have captured through pit method or through kata and. Uh, uh, through uh, other techniques, you know, we have removed and we have brought them into captivity. Most of these were selective in the sense that most of these captured ones were males. So we have also removed. In addition to the poaching in the in the earlier days, we have also removed the males, which has contributed to the uh, skewed sex ratio in the uh, current wild population. Civil wars have uh, created problem. This is definitely. From Indonesia, I'm mean, not from Sri Lanka, and also from uh, I have uh, some photographs from uh, Malaysia, also, you know, from where the mines kept by. We are actually going for snare in, in, in Kerala and other places, but they keep a mine actually in some of these places to protect their uh, crops, especially the, the, uh, the oil palm industry. The most interesting part. Our major threat currently is the trade in elephant skin. This is a major problem because you know earlier we thought you know it's only the males you know which has been threatened because of the presence of the tusk, or maybe tushes which which you can find uh, among the females or among the makana. But nowadays elephants are be being killed in Myanmar and other places, other countries for the trade in elephant skin. And they go for making pendants from skin, elephant skin. And you can see here, beads have been made, uh, tissues, and you know the skin is being removed, and they use it for this, uh, for making this. There is a lot of demand, and interestingly, <laughs> there was uh, websites you know selling such products in Chinese. So, uh, in one of our meetings of Asian Elephant Species Group, there was a debate, and the official representatives from China protested saying that no we don't promote and these are all allegations and we deny it but fact is fact still it is happening and nowadays so such uh, the people who had been working on elephant trade skin trade in such uh, Myanmar and other places are banned by China uh, from entering their uh, areas so this is also happening in our places there is a uh, problem like herpes virus. This is uh, considered to be a new generation uh, disease, which is reported even from the wild. Earlier, it was most of the reports were from captivity. Now, uh, veterinarians working on herpes virus uh, fear that there is a possibility of more and more uh, diseases, emerging diseases uh, among the elephants. This could be because of several uh, uh, anthropogenic pressure, according to them. Maybe further aspirations are required. Human elephant conflict or elephant human conflict, whatever you call it, or human elephant interaction and the neg negative interaction is called a conflict. 
which leads to loss of crops, loss of property, and loss of human life also. But then what happens? There is also a threat to the elephant. I'm now talking about only the elephant uh, population. There is a retaliation because of uh, human elephant country. People retaliate, the affected people, because of the loss of crops and uh, uh, damage to the uh, properties, or uh, damage to the infrastructure, they go retaliating. This is a spear. Definitely, they take a lot of risk. The people take a lot of risk to go close by and then spear this animal, this tusca. Poisoning. This photograph is, of course, you know, old one in 2003 or so in, from Nameri uh, in Assam, where uh, I think 13 or 14 elephants were killed in a series in, in, in one go because of the crop riding, people poisoned it. But such things are happening in a different manner in uh, some of these places. We have the incidences in, in, in Kerala where the people have gone in placing uh, not the poison, but uh, the, the explosives. Uh, and then uh, depriving the animal of, of uh, the, its organs, you know, like uh, the trunk and the mouth and the teeth, everything is gone. Managing the new elephant areas is a major challenge now in India. New areas means there had been, if you look at the history of these places, again, I'm talking about the ecological history and the natural history and maybe capture history. We may have to look at it. This is definitely the first intrusion or i will call it as first encroachment by elephants to new area was uh, towards antra antra pradesh from tamil nadu uh, so elephants a herd of elephants moved to chitor district of antra and from there they went to tirupati part of tirupati and the other places and uh, that time uh, the chief minister of uh, uh, nt ramarao he said you know ganesha is coming and it is a good omen so let us welcome the elephants. It was a good move, but people who are not familiar with the wild elephants, they started going to the elephants, you know, with the fruits and you know, coconut and everything. And some of them were blessed and went to heaven, hopefully. So that was another reason. Uh, so they didn't know exactly what to do. This has happened. This is actually for, I mean, uh, the map uh, when uh, the Karnataka, from Karnataka, elephants moved to Maharashtra. And uh, one part went to uh, the interior of this place, and another part went to this place, and then from there to Goa. And uh, interestingly, the Govan Parliament, Govan Assembly, passed a resolution saying that the elephants should uh, move back, and you know they should take immediate action, without knowing or with knowledge or anything of that language of uh, used by this Govan Assembly. The elephants moved back to Maharashtra, so they didn't go further to uh, the Goa areas otherwise we would have had the first uh, elephant population nearer to the beach in our in a, at least in our mainland i mean i'm forgetting about the elephants in uh, andaman nicobar islands so we have this the elephant and the people again didn't know what exactly is happening now i'm told that the elephant population is coming down but this is not the end of it in chatisgarh the elephant started there was record of elephants uh, elephant presence in chatisgarh long long back about 120 years back when mughal has captured a lot of elephants from chatisgarh but in the recent recorded history there was no uh, presence of elephants in chatisgarh but all of a sudden they got elephant from uh, from odisha and from jharkhand and chatisgarh became an, a, a state with elephants there also, and now Chhattisgarh is one of the states with a major loss of human life and major crop uh, loss of crops because of human elephant conflict. Such things are happening everywhere. The most interesting part is the, the current movement of elephants from, from the uh, uh, from Guru Gasidas, that is from. Uh, uh, in uh, Chhattisgarh, Guru Das uh, National Park and Sanjay Tiger Reserve, the elephants are moving to Madhya Pradesh. And uh, uh, they used to visit, keep on visiting in the year 2002 to 2007, 2009, 2013, and from 2019, a population has now 38, 38 elephants. Wild elephants are resident now in Bandaugat Tiger Reserve. 
since 2019. So Madhya Pradesh also is getting elephants now. And the herd is breeding uh, also in Bandavgat. That means the population has almost settled. And uh, uh, the Sanjay Tiger Reserve Corridor in 2018, Guru Gasidas. This is one of the important areas of Chhattisgarh. And seven elephants were seen moving from Sanjay, uh, moving in Sanjay Gandhi, Ch Sanjay Tiger Reserve, Siddhi, since March 2019. And two wild male elephants strayed into Kanna Tiger Reserve in, uh, two, in the summer of 2020 and believed to have crossed from Odisha to Chhattisgarh, then Maharashtra, and then into MP in Balgad district. So uh, traversing around five districts. So this is something interesting. Elephants are also finding new areas you know, for their own survival. Maybe historical remembrance or historical record must be there in somebody's brain or uh, it is there. There's a possibility. Or maybe because of some other factors that may be happening in the area. What do we do now? We have around 29,000 or 30,000 elephants in the wild in India. And we are trying to conserve these through elephant reserves, 30 elephant reserves, which covers around 65,000 square kilometers. And the largest is the, the South Indian population, and you have it in Odisha and Assam. But what is the point in having declaring an area an elephant reserve unless and until you solve the problems of conservation? Because elephant reserve doesn't have any any legal protection like wildlife sanctuary because wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, community reserve, conservation reserve, these are declared, our tiger reserves are declared under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And uh, there was an amendment uh, to include tiger reserve also under uh, the protection, Wildlife Protection Act. But the elephant reserves uh, have protection only because of the status of the reserve forest. And uh, once it starts moving out, then we have the problems also. So out of the forest, reserve forest also, we have the problems. So currently, we are trying to do this. And uh, any aspect of elephant conservation cannot be cannot leave uh, the, the captive elephants, elephants in captivity. Remember, we are not talking, we are not saying domesticated elephants because elephants cannot be domesticated. Elephants, wherever it is, it is wild only, wild in nature. And we have, we are keeping it in captivity. Out of the, the Asian elephants, uh, 22 to 30 percent of the population is in captivity. And Myanmar, uh, with the surprisingly, has more elephants in captivity than in the wild. And most of these are not, most of these means, you know, elephants in captivity are not self-sustaining. And we still expect that elephants will come from the wild uh, to, to uh, increase the number in captivity, which may not be happening in the, in the near future. So, and we bring it, and probably the best uh, elephant camp is in Tamil Nadu, where there is, the, they are maintained like a herd, and there is an interaction between different age sex groups and they are left in the forest uh, for uh, grazing so there is uh, they, they go for different uh, type of uh, plants uh, for their as their food so they don't have much problem like impaction and uh, such uh, foot rot or such things are not much in, in some of these areas and uh, is there any breeding in captivity happening in kerala no in most of the places there is no breeding in captivity. How can it breed? You know, when you have 98% of the population is males in Kerala, you have the tuskers, and you know, the females, whatever females you have, they are not at the breeding age or they are all isolated. They are not forming herds and they are not in social groups. They are all isolated. And we don't have animals. And we expect that, you know, the breeding in captivity should be unless and until the population in captivity contribute to conservation there is no conservation value for the elephants or any animal in captivity so one of the major purposes of having any animal in captivity is that we have we they can contribute to the conservation they can contribute to the knowledge about the elephants uh, or uh, any animal in captivity on the on its lifestyle and its requirements and currently 
this is a situation that we have uh, we use it in festival maybe to some extent this help in conserving but uh, because they have a love for the elephants but they love only the elephants in captivity they don't have that much love for the elephants in the wild and they are not concerned about the conservation of elephants in the wild so this is this is another issue and look at the crowd you know how do they manage and we have something called a captive elephant ma elephant man uh, management of i mean captive elephant management rules but what happens you know in some places in now currently they are implementing and forest department is enforcing uh, but this is the way uh, how how can you expect a wild animal and how many people are there on the top of an elephant and every time they will change all these people must have paid to the mahout or to the people who have brought the elephants to this festival for uh, uh, getting on this elephant back and uh, maybe after 10 15 minutes these people will go another another group will come i really love this animal for its tolerance and we don't have tolerance when it comes to the conflict situation and this is how sometimes this is an old story but must be happening somewhere without the knowledge of the even with the concern and this is how we do that the captive ones and this is it we feel that now elephant is decorated like anything and we say that the elephant lovers are a premi they are not lovers of an elephant they are not bothered about the elephant management they are bothered only about certain elephants and this is a sort of oh, the way they are uh, actually looking at considering all these things in 2009 uh project elephant steering committee formed an elephant task force that time when jaram ramesh was the minister of, in the central government looking after the uh, ministry of environment forest and climate change he formed a committee to prepare an elephant task force to look at various aspects of elephant conservation in the country and suggest possible solutions and then for uh, to go for further action so to formulate strategies for further actions and i was a uh, member of this uh, 10 uh, member committee uh, preparing this elephant task force and you know we prepared a report we brought out a report called gaja if, if somebody is interested they can go to the ministry's website and they can download gaja that will give you a lot of ideas about uh, the present uh, or at least the status of elephants 10 years back and we had uh, prepared it in consultation we had uh, extensive consultation visiting all the part of the country and then talking to the concerned and inviting uh, suggestions so we have considered everything and then uh, scanning through the literature so that is something interesting i think you should also be aware of some of the books elephants and kings and environmental history there are certain such books available in in the market uh, which can be useful and this can be a uh, casual reading you know but this will definitely help you and giants and on our hands i don't know whether it is available now this is published by the food and agriculture organization on elephants in captivity and gone astray this is another one uh, by fao uh, published publication and you have another one called uh, elephants majestic creatures of the wild you know which is actually uh, uh covering it extensively on the evolution and the paleo and it will be surprised to know that you know the elephants have been there in most of the places including some parts of our, our states united states so this will be very very interesting book to this was edited by jahaskal shoshani who died in a, in a bomb explosion in ethiopia about uh, for four or five years back because my friend and we had the elephant interest group and i have also contributed to this book endangered elephants this is of course you know this is a, a so proceedings of the symposium on human elephant relationship and the conflicts this has happened in sri lanka in 2003 which this will also give a lot of historical background and the current scenario and i think you should also visit uh, the asian elephant species group uh, website which will give you a lot of information on the current status if somebody is interested in the disease and other aspects biology medicine and surgery of elephants you know you have the fowler and susan mcotta who had contributed a very good book this is something very interesting whoever is interested in such things you know you can definitely go through this 
This is the most interesting book which I have read on elephants. You know, a fellow, Tarkin Hall, he was searching for the elephant graveyard and there was an attempt. Uh, the government of Assam has engaged somebody to uh, kill a man-killing Indian elephant in Assam. So some hunter was engaged. This is a very interesting story. And uh, knowing these, these things, uh, the Tarkin Hall, that fellow a British journalist, he got permission from government of India to join this hunter, uh, the team of these hunters, and then go after them. So the, he joined this group, but his interest was something different. He has heard about the elephant graveyard from Africa. I have also seen some of the reports, you know, in Ado, some observations from Ado uh, National Park, where elephants, uh, uh, they come and collect the skeletons and then uh, they, they take it with a lot of respect to some places. But I don't know. I haven't seen any such graveyard as such. But this fellow thought, okay, I will find. In Assam, at least, I will go. And the uh, the the elephant which was supposed to have been killing people, the elephant was on the move, and it took days. I mean, it was days and days. The hunter team was after these elephants. It was moving from one area to the other one. Wherever they go, Tarkin Hall will go to the uh, people of that area, and they will ask, "Can you show me elephant graveyard?" He has been going on asking, asking, and ultimately, in one place, in one of the bars, somebody said, okay, there is a guy. There is an old guy who can show you the elephant graveyard, and he has a lot of knowledge about elephants. And he went to him, of course, with a bottle, because that man is a good eater, and he feeds a lot, and he is also a good drink drinker, uh, drinker, I would say, not a drunkard as such. So, in the conversation, he asked, this journalist asked him, can you show me the elephant graveyard? He looked at him, and the other guy, fellow looked at him and said, okay, we will go. We will go in the morning to that elephant graveyard. Next day morning, both of them started walking and climbing a hill. From there, and they reached the top of the hill. And still, you know, uh, Hall was not sure what, whether this man is taking to the graveyard or not. And at the, on the top of the hill, you can see the bodies of the, the elephant habitat and everywhere, and which has been converted to some extent. And starting from there, so Hall asked, where is the elephant graveyard? You have taken me to the top of the hill. He said, he pointed to the, the uh, elephant, uh, the once elephant habitat. And he said, this is the elephant graveyard. I mean, a very wonderful uh, end of uh, that. You know, that shows the the, the current conservation status of elephants in the in the whole of Asia. So this is something very interesting. I think with this, I would stop and uh, go for a discussion. I'm again sorry for the, the the technical problem with which. And this is the Bornean elephants. We had been there in Borneo recently, and uh, we couldn't see any. We could smell. We could see the dung and everything in the wild. But they have a captive. Uh, management uh, place, you know, where they rear the young ones, the cows. So this photograph is from that. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry again that you know we have killed, but I have, uh, I think I have successfully completed within the time, uh, not the time limit, but still. Okay, I'm expecting some questions definitely. Uh, yes, sir. Already there are questions. Uh, yes, sir, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's a even though it's a technical glitch. Uh, it was a very wonderful talk. Uh, so much uh, thing that we could learn in between. Uh, uh, so before uh, we end, uh, there are a few questions. Uh, uh, Can I, I stop ask? this presentation? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. You can okay. stop. Right. Uh, so one is the, what is the difference between Indian and Sri Lankan elephant? Uh, even though these two places are very nearby. Uh, there is not is much there... difference. I said, you know, the, the uh, anatomically. And morphologically, okay. see, I will tell you the interesting story of uh, uh, elephants. I see, somebody was asking me today in the morning. Uh, we had a discussion on captive elephant management uh, uh, because uh, is there any difference between the elephants in the south of western, south of Palgat Gap and north of Pal between uh, elephants in south south of Palgat Gap and uh, north of Palgat Gap? Because Palgat Gap 
somehow other people consider that you know this is something very very interesting so the question was that but then i said you know we don't know nobody and we don't feel like uh, so the question was i said uh, some incidents or some of the experiences which i have gained from some of the older people uh, there was a time when the elephants were kept for auction uh, by forest department when they capture in koni and uh, uh, in uh, kornad and in uh, the, of course you know from kolangod the whole right to kolangod raja has given all the rights to tamil uh, people and in other places so when they go for auction the first question from the people who are participating in the auction where is this elephant from then they will say okay this is from koni okay good that means people who are interested to go use it in logging timber logging they will go for that okay the other one is from koni or uh, other one is from uh, other place okay good good for festivals because you know it has a, a, a it can raise its head properly so they had some morphometric uh, uh, measurements or they had some experience that you know the elephants can be certain elephants can be used for certain purposes so that is very very interesting and then uh, you are asking about sri lanka there is not much difference i told you the major difference is between the african i mean between the uh, sumatran elephants and the rest of the one uh, like you know the number of ribs otherwise in the size and everything it's the same thing and i talked to you about uh, dwarf elephants also in borneo in most of the literature you will see dwarf elephants dwarf elephants and the history of dwarf uh, elephants in borneo is also interesting it is said it is reported that the elephants have come from uh, uh, somebody has donated elephants to the the king of uh, borneo that time and uh, the present population is from that particular uh, herd or from the particular elephants so and uh, dwarf elephants we are normally say that islands are very interesting uh, in islands whatever is there larger in mainland will be slightly smaller in uh, islands so islands are very 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 interesting areas you know for uh, uh, when you are if you are looking at morphometry or evolution and uh, uh, another thing dwarf elephants there is a uh, saying in uh, kerala about kallane especially those who go to agastyamala region uh, one particular mm -hmm. person from kani tribe will say that oh there is kallana here there is a photographer also who claims that you know he has seen kallane but no good photographs and in one case and we had uh, sent in 90s we had sent a team to these areas and i have also gone to some extent some uh, personally with uh, some difficulties but then uh there was not even a, this particular kani tribe person couldn't even show us a herd of i mean a, a group of dung which can which could have been uh, of uh, the dwarf elephant dwarf elephant should definitely have smaller uh, i mean small sized uh, dung he couldn't show and we when we ask for a good photograph they will say oh it was very cloudy and you know it was misty and you know the elephants could not be photographed there was one incident which was celebrated by at least some channels and uh, uh, we we had a meeting of uh, state wildlife board in uh, trivandrum after the meeting definitely there was a badakhana means you know we thought okay we are going to sleep for some time or we are going by back by train so we can have a sleep and we had uh, good food and suddenly the chief wildlife warden say oh isa please go to the place you know in uh, <coughs> somewhere near uh, palod there is a report of a uh, kalane so the chief conservator one of the additional uh, principal chief conservator mr kaler myself and the veterinary surgeon and we started moving to that place cursing this guys you know saying because after a heavy food you know it was very difficult to climb the hills so what we were going on walking walking and climbing and at the top we reached and we found an elephant which was a normal elephant which is Uh, almost a uh, uh, just crossed the juvenile stage and it was having dysentery it's a prodaria there was a problem and the herd was somewhere nearby this is the one which they had mentioned it as and this is the one uh, the uh, this was the elephant of 
for debate in channels and a friend of me called me the, when i was ne very near to the elephant because the elephant was docile and he was asking hey where are you and uh, the channel uh, or the channel is discussing about the kalane so why are you not uh, participating i said i am near the so called the kalane next day mm -hmm. this elephant which was sick was brought to captivity and the dna test was conducted no difference it is the same one so a lot of stories have been made you know like this so there is not much difference or uh, uh, and the same is true in the case of uh, other things also sir another question what is home range and uh, difference between home range and territory it's the same thing the home range is not defended you can see the uh, same uh, area will be occupied uh, by different herds whereas in the case of territory which is mostly in the case of uh, predators say tiger uh, you will see uh, that you know this is defended through in absence of defense you know basically by chemical communication you must have seen them going for uh, urine marking scent marking in different places and that's a mechanism to say that this is my territory you must have seen in the case of dogs also you know the, the they mark their territory and whoever is coming inside uh, will be uh, recessive or they will be submissive to their dominant one so that's a major thing and some people use it even the elephant case also they say that i also have said you know the territory of uh, males are much more uh, because you know it covers several uh, uh, female herds okay so one of my doubt is that uh, the, uh, there are so many elephants that are kept in camps uh, like uh, in koni uh, masnagudi are there cap are these uh, captive animals or uh, anything else what do you mean by cap they are in uh, captivity definitely yeah, yeah. you want to say yeah, that okay. whether so, it has come from wild or whether it has come from the captivity uh, yes sir okay uh, there was not much contribution from captivity because i said that you know there has been not much breeding reported for a long time there has not uh, a breeding reported from kerala except uh, the shaji uh, the elephant owner in kollam claims that you know he has uh, not only claims you know he is uh, must be true that you know there was an elephant which gave birth uh, in captivity other than that i haven't heard uh, any any elephant birth uh, in uh, see look at our uh, Tamil Nadu is still maintaining. I think you know that's the best elephant camps in the whole of Asia, uh, which is maintained properly and which is managed properly with proper records and with the health records and everything. Uh, we don't have. Uh, we had uh, an elephant camp in uh, Parambikulam, which is no more there. You can see the kraal where elephants used to be trained, and uh, there was one in uh, Nilambur, which was very famous, where there was an elephant called Shakuntala. She gave birth. Uh, and even the mahat didn't know that she was pregnant because she got uh, uh, fertilized or she was mated by a wild elephant uh, and uh, it, till the end the even this man didn't know that so likewise very few so almost uh, some of these uh, say the elephant rehabilitation center is coming up in uh, niyar kotur in niyar in trivandrum where uh, we expect that you no know, those elephants you know which are which may be captured or which are coming to the uh, captivity as orphans uh, you get a lot of orphans so these will be reared and this will be maintained and possibly rehabilitated i don't think you know we are going to rehabilitate back to the wild may not happen but still there will be at least near natural condition will be provided there is enough space and there is going to be an interpretation center so such facilities are possible in some places whereas i don't like uh, the what they call the elephant museum in koni no it is only just photographs there is nothing it doesn't convey anything you have some in the middle of the in the middle of the city you cannot think of uh, having an elephant camp and where you have to cross uh, we have to take the elephants through crossing the road to the nearby water holes now it's not an apt place for that so this is the best possible uh, sir i have one question uh, regarding sir, the there is another question oh sir okay okay uh, just one uh, quick question so so oh, you can uh, when when a uh, male elephant moved out of the herd will it recognize its mother later at some time or we don't say that you know it will recognize the mother but 
they definitely they can come back to they, this that is why they are related related uh, they join back to the wild i mean to the original herd also that is okay. happening so uh, but we don't know exactly whether it is uh, recognizing uh, but it is possible that you know, they they can elephants can identify their relatives uh, they identify their clans that is that is why there was a mention when i was talking that uh, the there was a uh, what do you call you now the the aggression is possible between unrelated herds uh, when they meet uh, okay so possible yes so another question uh, is there any study uh, regarding conservation of animals which are uh, kept in capture or uh, used for uh, temple uh, of festival purposes <laughs> this is what i was criticizing today in one of the meetings in the morning uh, till afternoon we had been discussing about that there is a problem here because i said that you know we expect that the, any any animal in captivity should contribute more uh, contribute more knowledge on the uh, on that particular animal so we also expect that way uh, for the elephants also say so what what is the claim now you have uh, See, Makke and Jainuddin and his team from in Sri Lanka, they were the first to report on mus in uh, first means, you know, they had studied on a long term basis. They had studied the elephants in mus in Sri Lanka and they, theirs, were, theirs was the first report or study on mus in Asian elephants. And they have recorded, uh, they have uh, reported their observations, published their observations. We used to say that, you know, okay, how many elephants oh elephants is in mass and we have darted the elephant and you know we have captured it and we have brought it micro two and all those things you know we claim what is your observation how long an animal is going and how many animals are in mass and uh, what is the periodicity for that particular elephants not much there is nothing so contribution to science contribution to the information contribution to the knowledge about elephants is not much. Uh, I think you know we, we just claim these are all for celebrations and celebrations and celebrations to come to the newspaper. I don't uh, think uh, there is much contribution, conservation, contribution to conservation. That's where I said, if you want to contribute, if the captive elephant should uh, can contribute, uh, if the captive elephant can be used for conservation, then there should be breeding program and. The animals should be left free at least one one month in a year. I had been suggesting this for a long time in the Elephant Welfare Association. I made a comment. I made a statement that elephants should be left free. Our captive elephant should be left free in the sense you know, with the chain and with the mahout staying there. At least for uh, uh, a month. In the wilderness, there is no problem because there is no other elephant nearby. So that is a good place, I suggested. And the elephants can be brought on, on a rotation. And there could be facility for a stay by, of, uh, for the Mahats. So that elephants will be happy. Sukha Chikilsa will be good. The elephants will appreciate it. And the elephants will be happy to have so much of food. There won't be any impaction. There won't be any foot rot. So there won't be much problem. Immediately... It was protested. I was criticized. And now people have started talking about it. I am talking about in 90s, I have mentioned this. And I was supported only by Avana Parambu Maheshara Nambudri Part. He said, historically, the forest department used to collect five rupees and allow private elephants to go for grazing for a particular period in Vadakanjari forest. So that is that. Now everybody is talking. Yes. We should have, we should have. Yes, we should even now, I think, unless and until we take very stringent measures, unless and until we take very, very strict measures and knowingly, uh, the owners are also aware of it. We cannot, uh, our, our uh, elephants in captivity is going to extinct. I, I can guarantee that if this is the trend. Remember, 34 elephants died in captivity in 2018. And I am told today that at least 25 elephants per year is the death. And currently we are having only 482 uh, for uh, for 90 elephants. And it is coming down from 1,000 to 
480 and it is going down 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 and ultimately we will not have anything so we have to think we have to think about the management practices and how how do we maintain the elephants that is enough for the elephants <laughs> Uh, Ashwadi, uh, Mrs. Ashwadi Kaimal has uh, asked one question. Uh, the elephant also being known as a uh, heritage animal. Why it is not given the same status as tigers? <laughs> Very interesting. Because elephants have not been, uh, I mean, this is my personal uh, sarcastic comment. Elephants have been never uh, appreciated by the Britishers as such. You know, tiger was. Tiger used to be shot. <laughs> no, but that's not the only reason. The tiger population went down like anything. We had very few tigers left in the wild. So that was one of the reasons for uh, uh, giving such a st higher status for tiger. Maybe we'll wait. I, I always make a joke about that also. We'll wait for an animal to be highly endangered to afford uh, to extend protection, which is not fair. We have to take precaution. We have to act uh, uh, earlier to see that you know such a catastrophe doesn't happen i think you know that should be the way definitely uh, more and more money is pumped to tiger uh, program in national tiger conservation authority and uh, whereas project elephant and you have a member secretary a senior the most officer in the country and then they have uh, several uh, forest officers of higher rank in the ntc national tiger conservation authority Whereas Project Elephant is managed by just a Project Elephant director and uh, uh, he is given currently uh, a, a technically qualified veterinarian to help him. That's all. And now he has approached Wildlife Institute of India to act as a as a center for uh, studying more to conduct and to programs you know, for conservation of elephants. They are also trying their best. Uh, so money is not enough and manpower is not good. And uh, most of the money is going for paying esgratia uh, or uh, what they call compensation for uh, crop riding. So that's also a problem. Sir, uh, another last question that has been pinned in the uh, chat box. Uh, so elephant has are been looking after by different places. So which uh, part uh, you feel as most efficient? Pardon? I I'm sorry. I was just uh, The practice of looking after elephant is different. Uh, mm -hmm. from elsewhere so how they are different and which of the practice is efficient that we cannot say that you know these are all traditions uh mm -hmm. say uh, we don't have any traditional mahouts in kerala nowadays they they come as a they they look look as uh, the job of a mahout as a job only uh today i will be driving an auto return and tomorrow i may be uh in the government service as a mahout just without, because you know I have a certificate or maybe I will have a fake certificate. Uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, you have the traditional mahouts. A lot of them are there. And in uh, Assam, the culture is entirely different with a lot of uh, elephants in captivity. And they also leave it uh, in some places, you know, they leave it in the uh, wild for some time. And then, then, then they go back and then capture it and bring it back and then sell it to Kerlites. So, so many stories are there. Uh, I had the opportunity to interact with some of these so, so-called sellers uh, from Assam. Uh, very, very interesting figures. So the practices are different. Even the capture uh, uh, capture practices used to be different. So a lot of, lot of differences there. And this, is, uh, this has a historical uh, note also. It's not that you know it has all in a sudden changed from one practice to the other. No, and we cannot say exactly what is the best. So, but I think in a Tamil Nadu, I'm talking about Tamil Nadu because their management, maintenance, and the way they manage their elephants is definitely good. So that that way it is something better. I don't. It doesn't mean that. Uh, practices but in other places see elephant management in Tamil Nadu is mostly with the forest department whereas in Kerala it is mostly with the private people so that's a so private people differs you know their interest differs and their practice some people love it and I know that you know, they, they take a lot of pain to some of them take a lot of pain to maintain their elephants but some are not so that is the the issues
I think there was another uh, lot of uh, chat box. I should like. Oh my God, ninety-six uh, questions uh, or uh, comments. Uh, not, uh, not questions. The cat uh, elephant uh, can't spend more inside the forest as rehabilitation. Will it not communicate its diseases? Possible. Yes. Before leaving it back, any animal back to the wild means it has to be screened for all sorts of possible diseases, and then assure that it is disease free and uh, no communicable disease is there that is very very crucial and a lot of other uh, things are also whether it can mix with a herd is also they will rehabilitation itself is a science and you know there is a practice and there are uh, uh, organizations in uh, africa which is giving training to such people so rehabilitation is something very interesting will be familiar with the animal stories like Aidi Hamara, especially elephant stories. But we could read the captive elephant trying to were left free to act according to will. How could have such a thinking of Mahouts and honors of the old changed? A lot of things. What to do? Economics. Yesterday, as she was mentioning, economics of conservation and economics of having an elephants in captivity. A lot of uh, pressure. That is also there. I think I think you know that is something you know which uh, at least the Malayalis should uh, read that Kerala's because whoever can read Malayalam, I think very interesting uh, observations are there. That's why I said you know uh, the Vardan corner. Uh, that's something interesting. So likewise, you know, a lot of uh, old uh, literature on ecological aspects regarding the annual migration to Kabini, where they have more threats and fragmentation. Nilgiri Vasya Reserve. And how far the average distance they cover in, oh my God, I don't know the day. distance they cover. But there is a congregation. And definitely, uh, that has something to do with uh, the uh, aggregation. Uh, the congregation is could be unrelated herds also. And if you observe those elephants, you, will, you can even sometimes identify which are related and which are not related. I think somebody is telling that it is time 9.33. Yeah, it has been a very long talk. Now it will change the formation of the herd. Possibly there, there will be. I told you that you know, they will uh, uh, split and they may join again. Is there any, 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 uh, other than the thanks, no, is there any, any pertinent questions you know, which require sir, an answer? Sir, good evening. I would like no, to ask one uh, opinion of yours, sir. Sir, I am Saravanan. I am from Salem. Been quite some time I'm working on. I am from Salem, Salem, sir. Salem. Salem. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> and yeah. uh, quite long time I had been working on uh, captive elephants here, and uh, with my observations, I just want to ask you uh, your uh, opinions on that. See, the traditional medicine has a very good drug response with the elephants, and uh, than the modern medicine. What is your perspective on that, sir? One thing, and the second thing is. Uh, in captive elephants, we are uh, very commonly seeing the loss of pigmentation, cataract, and uh, uh, these kind of uh, things that we are very much uh, looking in uh, captive elephants. Do we have any solution for these kind of ophthalmological uh, uh, complications? And, uh, ophthalmological complication? Uh, like cataract, sir. A lot of elephants okay, okay. I have come across, they are suffering from cataract. And even mm -hmm. in tuberculosis treatment, I have seen that this traditional medicine was very well, uh, uh, having a very good uh, drug response in that, sir. I would like to have your perspective on that. Sir. I will. Uh, uh, we had a session with uh, one of the Ayurveda uh, physician who, used to, who has a lot of knowledge about from Hastya Ayurveda and other uh, uh, literature, older literature, and who used to be famous for uh, his Ayurveda treatment of elephants. Yeah. He said, you know, yes, but Ayurveda is not trying to cure the diseases. Ayurveda is trying to prevent the diseases, better management. Mm -hmm. And it needs, it can be done, according to him. For most of the diseases which we mentioned, see, uh, impaction, erendakate. Uh, which can be constipation, I mean, uh, original term, or in the uh, common man's term. And uh, uh, foot rot, all these are because of the, the result of the bad management. If an animal is, if an elephant is uh, uh, 
forced to walk or even after a long period of uh, in the hot sun or somewhere if the animal is given water immediately definitely it is going to have problem if you watch elephants in the wild you will see that elephants will come closer to the water hole but it doesn't go straight away it will be there around feeding for some time and then it cools down and then go for water so all these management practices are very crucial when you are talking about diseases and uh, according to him according to this uh, 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 deva what is his name i forgot yeah according to him devan nambudri he says there are a lot of uh, possibilities of uh, uh, elephant management through ayurveda uh, practices so I, i think you know the question is again even among the uh, human doctors you know there is a conflict between uh, homeo ayurveda and this thing and allopathy people do not have any respect for other treatment because allopathy feels that that's the end of it allopathy also again does cure only i mean only to, uh, treat diseases not preventive diseases prevention is not much given uh, i mean much uh, importance is given for that so i think you know this is something very interesting so that is very very and for cataract of course you know they don't have but why cataract that is also important and how does it come so i think you know the, the there are questions to be answered you can go for uh, maybe as a part of your uh, exercise or as a part of your uh, experiments you can go for a cataract surgery possible uh, but do we have facilities in india for all those kind of uh, cataract surgery do we have any facilities no, here no. sir because not even outside of, not even outside i was discussing yes. with uh, dr kushal sharma also sir regarding on mm. that and assam. he was telling a some friend Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, sir. Uh, he knows me very well, sir. Been long time uh, discussing things with. So him. what is he? What did he say? Uh, he was also telling it was very primitive, and uh, I was uh, able to talk to one other ophthalmologist in uh, uh, Alua, Chennai. sir. Uh, no, in uh. Alua, Mr. Gokulan, and uh, mm. he was uh, he was uh, he was an Ayurvedic uh, ophthalmologist, and uh, he was giving me some suggestions regarding it. and i don't know how scientific it was and uh, we just need to See, explore on that you can theoretically yes but then how to do that say so how to uh, the, the, i think uh, the veterinary university has uh, or they are going for an x ray uh, okay. machine for uh, screening the internal organs or something like that but problems uh, i think you know they have done it uh, this cataract uh, surgery has been done for a tiger or lion in uh, uh, chennai veterinary uh, but it's possible for such animals but not for elephants you know you have to keep it under sedation for a long time uh, very difficult yeah but uh, dr gokulan was having a good uh, case studies about his inspections sir yes just observed and he is doing a case study mm. it was very interesting possible, but very difficult Has yes, anybody has done any study regarding the conservation of elephants which are in captivity and are used for festival purposes? Not much. Uh, Sridharan, uh, who is a wildlife study, I mean, who is doing his uh, PhD on elephants and he is about to submit. He has made some observations on the stress among the uh, elephants in captivity. And oh, the, there was uh, so. Other than that, not much. everybody claims you know that's what i said you know not much contribution to conservation uh, since uh, sarvanan uh, was asking about uh, uh, another thing you know on tb i yes, raised sir. this question today with the with the veterinarian who has uh, but who his report is yet to be seen uh, he said you know, i have studied for eight years where is your report and he says you know in the tropical condition elephant with uh, tb Uh, will not transmit to other elephants and uh, to the human beings doubtful because uh, recently recently means you know some one week back i have a paper from uh, uh, us zoo studies from us zoos elephants they have a problem there because you know they go for uh, they are uh, they say that you know there are uh, recent reports of uh, tb tuberculosis among the elephants there and they are worried and that should be kept separate Uh, separated from other elephants and but he says that this i mean our friends say that you know it is 
uh, because you know the climate is different there and there is a possibility so that's a problem sir in uh, tb we have come across uh, some uh, live cases sir and uh, we have seen the very good case studies on uh, treatment and even now we are looking on for one in kumbakonam that is uh, uh, it it has is a drunk block for drunk past two years sir you know two years it is breathing only with its mouth sir so oh. uh, so so critical situation it is there but almost most of the elephants of south we have screened and we have made reports and presented it to the chief wildlife warden about mm. the health status of the elephants sir it was a very nice observation that you had been also working so much so i just wanted to no no uh, say uh, you, you can uh, probably i don't know whether you have published this no sir we are not so technical we are uh, we are just working on for conservation and uh, we took permission we have a small uh, uh, hospital veterinary hospital in rajapalayam also sir and uh, there we have rescued and uh, we have uh, treated some elephants on foot trot and uh, we have got very good results also sir and uh, so you must be familiar with uh, dr manoharan and uh, yeah, yeah uh, everybody they all know me very well sir they all know me very well and i we have kalaiwanan uh, yeah yeah they all everybody okay. knows me very well sir they can i want on to jharkhand you know poor fellow without knowing hindi has problem <laughs> yeah yeah sir he's, he his knowledge is good you know you have better people there yeah yeah we have sir we have we do have uh, but you know a lot of uh, issues a lot of priorities yes sir yes sir so so for this tuberculosis normal uh, medi medications uh, which which is given to the human beings won't work for elephant or is different saravanan can reply but i think uh, i am told that uh, maybe dosage may be it is treatable it is curable that is what we are told is it not saravanan yes sir uh, there are good reports sir because uh, for the elephant in salem it was very critically ill with uh, tuberculosis uh, namakal veterinary science college they were Uh, giving treatment and uh, Dr. Jay Tangraj also visited from uh, Chennai and they all made a very elaborate thing, sir. But uh, what happened is uh, there was no good follow up uh, from the mouth side or something. After all, when the mahout changed, then it took a different turn, sir. This fellow is a traditional mahout and he was having a lot of literature with him and he was making some of his own medication and he gave a fantastic result in a very short time. the elephant uh, was very much clear of uh, tuberculosis and uh, i was very amazed with his knowledge about his traditional medicines with the elephants uh, and i i wanted to make a study on that but he was not giving me that literature but uh, <laughs> still has it sir <laughs> this is the problem ownership of the literature yeah, yeah. Uh, he told us people has uh, mentioned about uh, 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 twins reported in sri lanka i'm sure that she got it asudhi is still around she must have got it from the newspapers because i have given the information to the newspapers there somebody was asking about the the twins and uh, there was only not recently it was there it was reported from sri lanka that's all not much and uh, recently also there was one so i think it's already time it's already 945 Uh, yeah, yes, sir, sir, yeah, 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 sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am not bothered. <laughs> yes, sir. Can yes. I ask you a doubt? Yes, yes. Pardon? Uh, sir, am Vishnu. I am I audible? Yeah. Oh, unfortunately, I always uh, Vishnu Tavara. Whenever I look at your photographs, I feel that you know I read it as Vishnu Tavara. Anyway. Sir, it's uh, Tavara, sir. Tavara. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tavara is a place anyway near Ramakulam. So. Uh, <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, sir. sir um, i have seen uh, i have seen the recent trend uh, it's not a recent trend even in my generation also there is a anaprimate uh, trend go, growing on um, mm. so what what can i act or what can i do to reduce the trend at least even See, in my even in my small discussion with my friends i, I told these elephants are these uh, these uh, this much big animals they want to go walk this much distance and uh, eat this much and uh, drink this much water <laughs> i cannot do much so what can i do to reduce that uh, anapremi trend or something see these are all uh, anapremi they love only one elephant they of their choice 
and sometimes i feel that it is like our uh, film star fans association uh, promoted by certain groups when there was an incident uh, in kerala where you know we had uh, i was a part of that uh, we had taken a decision that an elephant cannot be uh, let uh, out then they started my god through social media they started agitating saying only for that elephant they are not bothered about the elephant i think most of them are not bothered about the elephant they are working for something else in most of the places that is what is happening so if you are bothered about the elephants be frank and be scientific no. and use your common sense and then do that otherwise there is no point an environmental engineer would love to work in conservation of elephants some advice from you <laughs> it depends ah uh, environmental engineer okay environmental engineer i was just thinking that it is an electronic engineer and then there was a scope anyway it depends uh, i think uh, navin navin no ashwadi kaimal you can be in touch with me you are you there yes sir anyway ashwadi you can be in touch with me through dhruv or somebody or even directly uh, you can use my email id and we will have a we'll find out depending on your uh interest yeah indian express has reported about the trin elephant yeah they had a discussion with me also on that so your microphone is not working an engineer who cannot rectify the microphone <laughs> i'm sorry i think a lot of people have left because it was too late to start yes sir that was also so, so So could we conclude now? Oh yeah, please. If there is no other question, uh, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Isa on all our behalf uh, for taking time uh, to share his experience with us and uh, and to explain about the habit habitats as well as various socio-economic aspects in uh, uh, elephant conservation. Uh, also, I would like to thank all the participants for their enthusiasm and support. So in spite of being two hours, in spite of being the technical uh, glitch. many of them are still left uh, so that uh, indicate the interest that sh they show in such seminars or the webinars hmm? i are uh, all the members i encourage uh, uh, all the members of uh, arunyaka society as well as the green pix pixel uh, have my gratitude for untiring effect making this uh, webinars a grand success so this is not the end this is all the third day now we have four more uh, webinars uh, going uh, for the next four days on the next day we have Uh, at the same time itself so tomorrow we will have a uh, another presentation uh, i think by srinivas reddy sir yeah arish uh, pcc yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, tomorrow uh, we will be having uh, a topic on hill area development and conservation in nilgiri biosphere by uh, srinivas reddy who is an ifs officer working in forest department tamil nadu Uh, on the next day we have eco development and wildlife conservation kerala by srinivas sanjay uh, uh, yeah, kumar who, who is uh, conservator of forest uh, forest department kerala and on the uh, 7th we have uh, uh, a, a talk uh, by a well known uh, bird photographer jaini kuriyakos on bird photography experience so she will be talking about the experience that she uh, shared with this different photos and on the final concluding day on the 8th we have wildlife house central kerala by david and raju uh, central so india as uh, as in central india in central india sorry wildlife of uh, central india so this has been a pleasure uh, to meet you all uh, talk uh, to hear uh, such a very good uh, interesting lecture hope that uh, you will be again be our uh, uh, faculty or uh, present in any uh, in the future endeavor also Anytime. thank you sir Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, sir. And always, thank you so much. I always sir. love talking about elephants or wildlife. You know, that's interesting and interaction. I yes, learn sir. a lot from the participants also. Anyway, that's great. Yes. Thank you all. Sir, hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. Ah, Ani, it's not. I think I have to do that. I think class is going to be a wonderful session. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, what are you talking about, sir? നമുക്ക് അനിമൽ ഒരു റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ഉണ്ട് 
വളരെ അടുത്ത് നമുക്ക് അനിമൽ കോൺഫ്ലിക്റ്റിനെ കുറിച്ച് ഒരു ക്ലാസ് കൂടി സാറിന്റെ വേണ്ടി വരും എപ്പോഴാണോ നിങ്ങൾ ഫ്രീ ആകുന്ന പറഞ്ഞാൽ മതി അതിനനുസരിച്ച് ഞാൻ ഫ്രീ ആക്കാം എന്ന് ഓക്കെ സോ താങ്ക് യു ഓൾ ഗുഡ് നൈറ്റ് ഗുഡ് നൈറ്റ് താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു സർ ആൻഡ് താങ്ക് യു ഓൾ താങ്ക് യു ഓൾ താങ്ക്സ്